Uh, meantime, uh, Uber is likely uh, happy to be leaving 2019 in the rear view mirror. The stock dropping more than 20 percent from its public debut through the end of the year. But shares are now on the road to recovery, up more than 25 percent over the past two months. Joining us right now to talk about whether the nightmare is finally over for Uber investors. Michael Graham is here, managing director and senior equity analyst at Concord Genuity. And Tom White, senior research analyst at D.A. Davidson. Good morning to both of you. You like the stock? Uh, I, I do. I like both Uber and Lyft. I think. Like, um, which one do you like better? Well, um, I think they're different. You know, yep. uh, Lyft has a more contained investment profile only in the U.S. Uh, you know, likely going to grow faster and you know get to profitability. You know, on time. Uh, Uber is building a bigger platform, global in scale. That's uh, going to require more investment. There are more businesses, so they're going to appeal to different investors at different times. What's a fair price for the stock? Uh, look uh, for for Uber. Yeah, right now we've Uber. got we've got a forty five dollar price target. Okay, I, I, I better think, than where we are now. And our price target's based on kind of a twelve to eighteen month time horizon. For us, the difference between you know wanting to own one or the other is a question of time horizon. You know, I think if you can hold the stock for three or five years, Uber's probably pretty darn interesting down here. Uh, we think that it's obviously got more scale uh, over time in these types of businesses. That scale will translate into a margin advantage, a more liquid marketplace, and so that could put it in a very good position. It's just in the near term, the visibility we think is a lot more limited at Uber than it is at Lyft. Uh, Politico's reporting this morning that they think California's, what is it, AB5, the law that requires you to have full-time employees or pay your workers as workers instead of contractors, they think that's going to really heat up in the middle of the year because that's when the case will go before the, the state Supreme Court there. Are you betting with your assessment that Uber is able to win on that front? Are you putting it off as, as something you're not addressing till right now? What do you think? Maybe I'll jump in. I mean, I, I think the most likely outcome is that California legislators and the gig economy, com gig economy companies uh, basically hash out some sort of middle ground. I don't think the governor of California wants to be the governor of a state that sort of quashes this kind of nascent gig economy uh, with very sort of punitive uh, actions that AB5 uh, has in it. Uh, so I think that's what's happening right right now. In the background, you've got this ballot initiative that the companies have have put up. Uh, they're sort of using that as as a way to uh, pressure uh, legislators to to kind of come to the table and hash something out. Interestingly, if that settlement isn't hashed out by I think it's late June, that goes on the ballot for November 2020, no matter what. Well, what does that mean to the stock? Well. We, we have, um, you know, if you look at the financial impact of AB5, if it's just in California, it ends up being a couple thousand more dollars uh, per driver per year that, you know, Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and some of the other companies. Yeah, but clearly they think it's a big problem, which is why they're fighting it, yeah, and it well, could get picked up in other municipalities, other states. I think the real issue is, does it happen in other states, you know, beyond California? I agree that, you know, California is likely to reach a compromise. Um, right. You know, this whole debate is likely to sort of peak in volume around the time of the November elections. Most of the state legislators in California that are supporting this, um, you know, bill being uh, put into action are up for re-election. So, you know, you would expect the news to kind of die down a little bit. How worried are you, I don't know, worried or happy are you that, that Uber clearly seems to be changing or shifting uh, its model or strategy to some degree to try to get to profitability quicker and what that means long term about the growth prospects. I, you know, this has been a major sort of dynamic that's hit the whole tech industry right. as we've you know, gone through. Is that a good thing, though, or a bad thing? Um, I, I think, you know, it's, ne it's neither. I think, um, you know, what you're going to have is when you have a more permissive public capital markets environment, you're going to have companies building, you know, yep. huge platforms for the long term. And when you don't have that, you're just going to have companies growing a little more slowly, but, you know, maybe a little more responsibly. Look, I, I think it's, I think one of the big issues for Uber right now is that both the, them exiting, deciding to exit countries because mm -hmm. they can't be the number one two, or two player or some of these issues like AB5, they are, they are TAM eroding. They are, are, are reducing or eroding the size of the addressable market that Uber has basically pitched to investors during right. their roadshow. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that Uber can't be a great profitable business over time, but it just means that kind of the denominator that you're using to kind of base valuation multiples or market share is going to be a lot smaller, and it just creates a lot of uncertainty in the near term. Look, a big part of the pop that we saw just last week, Michael, was because of the news that was out there that Grubhub might be looking at all their alternatives potentially selling off, ending down the competition on that. That was the last few dollars bumping the stock. If that's not true, as Grubhub has said it's not, then what? 
You know, I think you're seeing it like that food delivery space is an important part of Uber's business. Um, what you've seen them doing is coming out of a lot of uh, international markets where they maybe don't have the real aggressive category position that they look mm -hmm. to have. Um, you know, I think that what you've seen in the U.S. market is a lot of investment from a lot of players trying to gain share. Um, the same dynamic which is pushing Uber and Lyft to try and develop right. more profitability is also impacting a lot of the private companies in this space, so that could rationalize. Uh, let me throw a final question in. Do you see a potential activist jumping into the Uber stock? It's really the only unicorn, public market unicorn, that is a single voting a single vote stock, meaning everybody else has two classes of shares. This one does not. Unclear to me what an activist could do, either try to run the business more for cash or try to grow the business at the expense of cash and whether investors would go along for that ride. Look, I, I think there's potential, given the, uh, the stock class issue that you, that you mentioned. Uh, in terms of what they would do, I think you would see them accelerate uh, so exiting some of these uh, less profitable markets or markets where Which there isn't make a the denominator even lower. Yeah, so term. it's it's again sort of this um, long. You know, this has always been a trade-off between short-term right. interest of investors versus sort of longer-term right. focused investors. Uh, but you know, I think Uber is trying to probably stem some of that uh, buzz right. by you know potentially exiting India. They announced uh, over the weekend that they're going to step out of Colombia, where they're having a lot of regulatory trouble. So uh, you know, maybe that mitigates the risk of, of an activist a bit. Michael and Tom, great to see you. Thank you.